Are you a business owner or entrepreneur who's had great success in the business world? And now you want to launch a speaking career to share your message with the world. If that's you, then listen up. 25-year speaking industry veteran Brett Ridgway has released his latest special report, Three Key Things Entrepreneurs Must Master to Build a Profitable Speaking Business. To pick up your copy, go to breadridgeway.com forward slash freebie. Welcome to the Spotlight on Speaking Show with Brett Ridgway, where you'll learn the keys to building a profitable speaking business from speaking industry pros. Each week, we interview a great guest who will share his or her speaking journey, identify what their keys to success have been, and highlight some critical mistakes they've made along the way that you'll want to avoid. Be sure to visit our website at spotlightonspeaking.com. And while you're there, subscribe to us via your favorite network. Now, sit back, tune in, and get ready to meet this week's guest. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Spotlight on Speaking show with Brett Ridgway. I am the aforementioned Brett Ridgway. I want to welcome you all here today. Now, my guest today is Suzanne Taylor King, and Suzanne is a master certified coach, positive psychology practitioner, author, speaker, and total comedian, not a partial comedian, total comedian. After careers in the dental field, then building a seven-figure retail chain and developing businesses retail, finding passion in aromatherapy, nutrition, and fitness, but then burning out, Suzanne decided it was time to follow her heart and create the life she truly desired with a business that enables her to work on her terms, follow her passions, and help high-level clients to gain the clarity, connection, and power to access and step into their full potential with maximum health and limitless energy. In less than five years, Suzanne created a dream coaching practice while raising her son and spending more time doing the things she loves. She now guides others to consciously create the success and fulfillment they dream of. Suzanne is currently based in New Jersey, but travels often for business and pleasure. When not running her business, Suzanne often will be mixing and blending essential oils or creating magic in the kitchen. And she enjoys being outdoors and in the nature in her spare time, paddle boarding, biking, and on adventures with her family. Welcome, Suzanne, to the Spotlight on Speaking show. Thank you so much, Brett. Excited for our conversation today. All right. So I've got a really important question to start out with here. And that okay. is, what do you like to cook in the kitchen? Oh, Italian food oh, and I Asian love, food. I love my love my pasta. Love my pasta. Yes. So. Yes. Uh chicken dishes, you know, from chicken parm to cacciatore to oh. Marcella, all those good dishes. You're, you're killing me here, Suzanne. I haven't had lunch yet, man. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're just we're coming off an interesting few days here. I'm in Terre Haute, Indiana, and we had those storms roll through last Thursday, mm. and pretty much seemed like it took out half the trees in the city, and half the traffic like still aren't working. I was without power for three days. Finally got it back yesterday wow. afternoon. So I was, it was nip and tuck there for a while whether I'd even be able to record today because I didn't have internet access or anything. I had to go to the library yesterday to get internet access to put out an episode so but it all came together and here we are so dedication my friend all right so Suzanne so you have a very interesting background in retail and all that stuff so mm -hmm. give, give us a few of the highlights if you would about what led you what were the first few steps in your business career and then we'll get into the speaking side of things shortly well, my very first business, believe it or not, I was 11 years old and I wanted to make some extra money. So I got a paper route and I quickly discovered that I hated delivering the papers. <laughs> I like collecting the money and the tips, but I didn't like delivering the paper. So I outsourced it. I paid a neighborhood boy who was a couple of years younger than me to actually deliver the papers. And my dad was very upset with me that I was doing this. And then when we actually talked about it, he was like, so what you're saying is instead of working an hour a day, you'll have to work an hour once a week, <laughs> said yes. And he encouraged the idea of outsourcing <laughs> that business. So that got my feet wet in the entrepreneurial spirit. 
And, but I went to college to be a dental hygienist because I felt, guess it, it was a safe choice. It was a, uh, a great moneymaker, full benefit career, and I wouldn't have to depend on anyone else. I could take care of myself with that career. And very quickly after graduation, realized that I wanted to start a business. And I was dating someone at the time who uh, was ready to go with a business. And we started it with $3,000, a retail store. Uh, and by the end of the first year had done $5 million in sales wow. and with no sign, no advertising. And we were actually in the basement of someone else's store. So it was all word of mouth and boy, was I hooked. I loved it. So what was the product line that did 5 million in the first year? Uh, snowboards, skateboards, clothing, accessories. And sneakers. All right. So how many years did you run that particular business? Uh, that was for five years okay. uh, until I decided I wanted a divorce. And it was a uh, divorce or business. And I decided that I, I was worth more than having a successful business. So I made the choice to leave that relationship and that business behind. All right. So what follow that up then business wise? That was starting another business for uh, a group of friends who were interested in my expertise in what I had done in my previous job. And all of this was before social media. Mm -hmm. So um, I was still working as a dental hygienist and helping that business start up. And that that was retail also, but in the medical niche. And I, I just caught the bug again for, I had this insight that, oh, I don't have to do the business to help someone start the business. Mm -hmm. And that was really my first consulting gig, even though I didn't know to call it that at the time. And from there, it was deciding to do it for a living, to actually charge for my expertise and my knowledge. And of course, I, I went through that period of time where I was feeling not smart enough, not educated enough, not good enough, imposter syndrome, all the things. And I got a couple coaching certifications and uh, some other little assets that I could use with my clients that made me feel more confident and hired myself a coach for my own business mm -hmm. and very quickly decided that entrepreneurs that I met online now, now 2009, I'm online. I'm starting to meet people and network with people in person and online. And I realized very quickly that entrepreneurs, they have this drive and ambition to work, 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 hustle, 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 two businesses, three businesses, but they weren't taking care of themselves. So my coaching practice back then focused on well-being and habits for entrepreneurs. So you've been at the coaching thing, it sounds like about 15 years now, roughly, coming yes. up on that. So when did you realize or decide that you needed to incorporate speaking into the marketing mix for building your coaching practice? It was totally not a marketing decision. It was a passion decision. Um, I was approached by a conference that happens in Philadelphia every year that was for women. And it was a health and wellness conference. And they approached me and said, would you be interested in being our MC for huh. this conference? And I was like, what do I have to do? Just be yourself. You're so funny. You're so outgoing. Introduce each speaker and, and, you know, infuse a little bit of you in with it. And it was so fun. Now it was a small, small venue, about 300 people. And I loved it. I loved being on stage. I love the microphone in my hand. I loved introducing other people. 
making people smile, making people laugh. And I thought, wow, how can I do more of that? Mm -hmm. And immediately I started putting out my feelers to my network. Uh, who needs a workshop? Who needs a speaker? And in the beginning, it, of course, it was for free. And I loved motivating, inspiring, but also using one of my natural gifts, which is a sense of humor and infusing that into my talks, because I believe stressful things can be made more easily digestible if you infuse some humor with it. I like to say, Suzanne, there are, in my mind, three types of speakers, keynote presenters, the platform selling speaker, and then the people who are just using it specifically as a business building tool. It could be a chiropractor, plumber, whatever it may be. So which of those arenas do you best like to play in? Or do you mainly like to do the MC thing these days? Well, I love the MC thing. That's super fun for me. And it also attracts people to me. So I would say speaking for me to small groups or companies is is really focused more on attracting people to what I do and what I offer. And it is a small revenue stream for my company, but I, I think my enjoyment of it, I almost feel feel guilty for getting paid to do it because I enjoy doing it so much. Um, so I would say number three, I, I use it as a vehicle for me getting in front of more people and it seems to work really well. So how do people primarily find you these days and for speaking engagements? Right now is really through people I know. Mm -hmm. um, my network's pretty large, as you can imagine, from doing this for 15 years. And uh, I get approached by other coaches who have mastermind groups or people who lead communities because I'm a community founder myself. So appearing in different arenas has really helped. So if you imagine, you know, I'm a coach for entrepreneurs. So me being in an arena where it's community founders is a whole new level of exposure for me. And then speaking to network marketing professionals, another whole area of exposure for me. Uh, giving a keynote to a room full of a hundred and some dentists, that led to more business for me because of my 20 year career in dentistry, immediately I had credibility with a room full of dentists. And out of that room, there was 10 or 15 who reached out to me about growing their business. And I ended up with five clients from that speaking gig. And, you know, so it's just looking at it a little bit differently than the normal person looks at speaking. So as a business building tool, what would your best advice be to aspiring speakers or coaches who are, are thinking about using speaking as a tool in their business mm. to make it as successful as possible? What are, what are your keys to success in that arena? Ooh, okay. Number one, don't be boring. Um, if you're speaking with other speakers, do your research. Know who you're sharing the stage with mm -hmm. and be different. And don't be afraid to be different. My very first paid speaking gig, I started doing research on the other speakers and found out everyone was a doctor except for me. And I had the choice to allow that to make me panic or, hmm, doctors are pretty dry, factual, a little boring. They're going to rely on slides. So I'm not going to use slides and I'm going to use my comedy and I'm going to get the audience involved. Stand up, sit down, raise your hand. And I was the highlight of that conference because I decided not to fit in with all of the other speakers. So by tapping into that unique mm -hmm. genius, I think really 
makes a difference. All right. So number one, don't be boring. What would number two be? Um, don't be afraid not to use slides. Um, I know a lot of speakers rely on slides, you know, for the visual learner in the crowd. But I find it tends to dim my personality. So using body language, facial expressions, even on Zoom, knowing the box that you're in, making eye contact with the camera and showing your hands, even on Zoom, can make people feel more engaged with you and more trusting of you. And not in a fake way. It's totally in a rapport building way. So speaking of building rapport, what would you say your greatest tips would be for building better rapport with your audience, whether it be a, via a virtual platform or an in-person event? Oh, gosh. Know your audience, number one. Um, know what keeps them up at night. Know their struggles and fall in love with the problems that they have so much that your talk gives them hope, insights, and some solutions. All right. So those are all such great advice, Suzanne. I do have a couple other questions I want to ask you. But sure. before we do, let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsor. Are you a business owner or entrepreneur who's had great success in the business world? And now you want to launch a speaking career to share your message with the world. If that's you, then listen up. 25-year speaking industry veteran Brett Ridgway has released his latest special report, Three Key Things Entrepreneurs Must Master to Build a Profitable Speaking Business. To pick up your copy, go to brettridgeway.com forward slash freebie. And we are back with the Spotlight on Speaking Show. My guest is Suzanne Taylor King. And one of my favorite questions to ask my guest, Suzanne, is, all right, bury your soul a little bit here and maybe share an embarrassing moment in your speaking career that you learned a valuable lesson from, but you would highly advise an aspiring speaker not to make that same mistake. Oh, gosh, there's been so many. Well, um, yeah. I, you know, pick, well, pick your best one. Pick the best one. Okay. Um, speaking to a group of attorneys and I had a preconceived notion about some of their pain points and I was totally wrong and it all came from my own you know preconceived biases about what it takes to be an attorney and who they are as people and I was wrong and that assumption that I made all came from like my dating history when I was younger. And I, <laughs> I literally made an assumption about the whole room full of people. And it was way off base because I didn't do my research. Um, I just thought I knew it. So don't, th don't think you know it all and really do your research on who you'll be speaking to. So what are your tips on how to do research properly to determine the best information you can about the demographics or the target audience? Well, number one, you know, if it's for a company or for an event where there'll be numerous different companies in attendance, research who was there years prior. Um you know, maybe look at the board of directors, look up LinkedIn profiles, and there's a lot of nuances to this. But if you really know who's in the audience, um, is it C-suite or is it factory workers? Uh, knowing those things can really set you up for using the right language that identifies with someone in the room and they'll be more likely to hire you, bring you back for another event. And I think knowing part of this is, you know, self-awareness and emotional intelligence, but it can all be done through research. Um, a company's demographics, like who are their employees? And even when speaking to a mastermind group of 10 or 12 people, I ask whoever hires me or brings me in, who are your people in the room? Male, female, age, what do they do for a living? Like, give me an overview. 
And that helps me pick the right language at the right time and also the right humor to infuse into my talk. Now, there are those that say be very careful with humor in any kind of speech. So how do you gauge what's appropriate or not appropriate humor-wise in a presentation? Mm, I don't anymore. <laughs> um, so I would say now, now that I'm established, I use more of my humor and I don't, I don't filter like I used to. But I would say if you're just starting out, and you care if people like you and hire you and want to come back, then it's important to keep it like five-year-old humor, you know, um, nothing about politics, nothing about race, nothing controversial and something that everyone in the room is experiencing. Mm -hmm. If I'm in the room with a group of women I don't know if I can make jokes about hair, nails, Botox, or like, I would never do that. But I would make a joke about children or raising children and working. And, you know, so that's, that's something that I identify with. And, you know, some of the women in the room will too. Now, Suzanne, you spoke earlier about bringing you back for a, another engagement or whatever. So what are your your tools that you use in terms of follow-up with speaking, you know, who we spoke to before to help stimulate those future events with the same organization? Well, I have a very archaic system of keeping track of people. And I have been pleaded with and prodded <laughs> to upgrade my system. But I keep paper notes and I also, anyone who has ever hired me or worked with me, any client connections, they all go in my phone. And one of the things that, <laughs> it's so funny. Um, so for, I'll use you as an example. We met, your contact information went into my phone, your email, your website, the fact that you had a podcast goes in the notes and I put your name on my calendar maybe three, three months after we meet uh -huh. because I don't add anybody to email automations. I, I do sue automations. So I, I literally just add people's names to my calendar in a period of time when it's time to reach out again and the reach out could look something like a Facebook message. It could be an email. It could be a text message, depending on how close I am with the connection. Now, my last speaking gig uh, that was live and in person was in Philadelphia. It was for a husband and wife team who put on events. And I stay on their radar with a Facebook message to the wife every so often. And I've provided massive value by introducing them to other speakers who would be amazing for their tribe. I participate in their Facebook group and they, they remember me as a person who not only brings other people to an event, like I just don't show up an event and speak. I invite my people to come watch me speak and that boosts whoever's having the events. Um, reach as well. So uh, that's kind of how I do it. All right. So Suzanne, I want to give you a couple of minutes to tell a little bit more to people about what you're up to these days and how they can get involved in your world if they would like to do so. Absolutely. I, I have an incredible community of entrepreneurs on Facebook called the Idea Lab for Entrepreneurs. And my private coaching and consulting is really focused on the one-on-one, -on -one, high touch, totally custom. I don't do online courses anymore or uh, coaching programs per se. Everything I do is custom created for my clients. And then I have a mastermind group um, full of coaches and then another group full of six-figure entrepreneurs. And my work week is 
um, three or four days a week. And I really focus on quality over quantity now at this point and love working with a wide variety of business owner rather than just other coaches or just authors. It really is exciting for me to be able to use, you know, 35 years experience as an entrepreneur to help someone else. We'll make sure links are down in the show notes below to all of Suzanne's social media platforms and her website and all that. So Suzanne, thank you so much for joining me today as my guest. Everybody out there, thank you for joining us too this afternoon or this evening or morning, whenever you may be catching this episode. But as always, I wish you the greatest of success in all that you do. And may this year be your greatest year yet. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. This has been the Spotlight on Speaking Show with Brett Ridgway. Be sure to join us every week as we interview speaking industry pros and have them share their best tips for building a profitable speaking business. Until next week, thank you for tuning in and remember to visit our website at spotlightonspeaking.com so you can enjoy even more great episodes like this one. While you're here, be sure to subscribe via your favorite network. We look forward to seeing you next time on the Spotlight on Speaking show. Until then, our sincere best wishes to you for the greatest of success as you work to build your own profitable speaking business.